Hi, Brave family. I am Jennifer Marshall, Executive Director of This Is My Brave, and I'm so glad you're here with us for another episode of Brave TV. The main concept of Brave TV is to bring stories of hope into the homes of our audience during the COVID pandemic. Each week, we will cover different topics that our own Brave alumni can uh, lend their expertise on. This gives our alumni an opportunity to share their stories again on another platform, to talk about their journey with This Is My Brave, and to offer support and resources to viewers who may be having similar struggles, especially during such a high stress time. This week's theme is men's mental health in honor of National Men's Health Week. Men's mental health is often overlooked by our society due to barriers and standards that we have created. According to Mental Health America, men are less likely than women to seek help for depression, substance abuse, and stressful life events due to social norms, a reluctance to talk, and downplaying their symptoms. This directly correlates to the fact that suicide is the seventh leading cause of death among men. We thought the best way to talk about this, about men's mental health, was to have the men do the talking. So we are so thrilled to have our first Brave TV guest, James Boomhauer, be our host this week. James and two other Brave alum, Marlon DeLeon and Kevin Early, are here to break down the barriers and begin the conversation surrounding men's mental health. It's okay to not be okay, and it's okay to ask for help. So without further ado, um, let's get this show started. We will all be live chatting in the comments, so be sure to let us know if you have any questions. Let's get started. Hello, uh, my name is James Boomhauer, and I've been asked to host today's conversation on men's mental health with two fellow This Is My Brave alumnus. Um, again, I'm James Boomhauer. Uh, I was a member of This Is My Brave Boston in 2018, and I will let Kevin and Marlon introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Kevin Early. I was in the initial, uh, this is my Brave performance back in 2014. I performed an original rap song that I wrote. I'm from Northern Virginia. I used to also be on the board of This Is My Brave. And I met Jen through a support group I was in many, many years ago before This Is My Brave even existed. We were in a support group together. And that's my connection to Jen. That's awesome. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Marlon DeLeon. Um, I was in the 2016 show in Chicagoland, more specifically in Valparaiso, Indiana. And that's where our, kind of where I'm calling in from. I'm calling in from South Bend, Indiana. If you've never heard of it, it's where uh, the University of Notre Dame is at. But I'm from California originally. So I'm quite a few thousand miles away from where I grew up, but I've been here for about seven years now. And this is also where I heard about This Is My Brave. Um, I heard about the auditions from a social worker friend of mine um, that I was in a play with. I was acting in a play here in South Bend, and we were talking about different things growing up, being in our 20s, being in our 30s, mental health, and she sent me a Facebook link to the auditions, and I love writing and blogging and storytelling. I wore my Storytelling Saves Lives shirt. That's convenient, don't you think? Hashtag Storytelling Saves Lives. And uh, just auditioned, went for it, and wrote something that I've never written before and presented it in a way that I thought I would only do once in my entire life. And they said they were gonna record it. And I thought, all right, yep, yeah, sure, I'll do this. I will present this monologue and take my clothes off at the same time. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure the link for that performance is below. Um, there's a lot of tattoos that happen. Um, you may have seen my uh, semicolon tattoo over here. Staying life, yeah, that's a big deal. Um, this is my brave has been integral to the last four years of my life. It was also around the same time my now wife and I started dating. I was at for like a second or third date, just taking her to this is my brave, and uh, we're uh, we're we. And bipolar type two. 
So never a dull day at the daily own house, but we are big, uh, big supporters of mental health, all things like counseling and therapy and talking it over and all of these things. And so being invited today to be part of the conversation for men's health, that's, oh, I absolutely would love the opportunity anytime I get to talk about this. That is awesome, man. Thank you so much. Um, for those who don't know, um, do you mind explaining the significance of a semicolon? Semicolon tattoo, yes. So I'll, for a closer look, the semicolon, uh, punctuation mark, um, it's often used to symbolize or represent or symbolize uh, suicide attempts. And they take it like if, in literary terms, the semicolon would stop a thought and then keep going. And that's what it means with and it's such a weird concept of when people talk about suicide attempts, how they talk about failed suicide attempts, how like, yes, I failed my suicide attempts, but I'm still alive. So it feels like a success. And you hear about, you know, celebrities that are quote unquote successful at their suicide attempts, but they're now gone and no longer with us. So it's, it's a weird, weird discussion to have. And it's a very, you know, touchy subject for a lot of folks, but um, the semicolon is very, um, what's interesting is that, the tattoo that I got, I got it in the summer of 2018. And then in January of 2019, right after my son was born, was when I had my most recent suicide attempt. And that's when I was diagnosed bipolar two. So it's like, this is, things are still happening. And like, I'm going to be 39 years old and my diagnosis is still changing and my meds are changing and my therapists have been changing, but my faith has not. And my faith has held strong and it's gotten better and my uh, appreciation for things like This Is My Brave have, have really grown and that's why I think more people should hear about it. More, more people need to know that storytelling does save lives. I was also going to commend you on wearing your, uh, your um, This Is My Brave swag. I thought that was a, that was a pro move for the, do, for the video I conference. do have a good t-shirt. I think, um, I think that the symbolism behind the semicolon and, and what the community has done to make that meaningful is awesome. And I think uh, I'm a big fan of metaphor and reframing and an explanation of things. And I think that that is absolutely awesome. Um, you guys gave an awesome rundown of your time with This Is My Brave. I'll, I'll just add a couple sentences to mine. Um, I said that I was part of This Is My Brave in 2018 um, in Boston. Uh, I'm coming to you guys just outside of Boston, Mass. Uh, one day I'll own enough money to uh, live in Boston, but not anytime soon. Um, I started a, a program that uh, revolves around men's mental health uh, and specifically the mental health of men in the healthcare and civil service setting called Stay Fit for Duty. And the talk that I gave at This Is My Brave in Boston revolved around the male healthcare provider's experience and the struggle that helpers feel when they need help and how unusual and uncomfortable a space that can be. Um, and that is really where I have um, started my journey and, and continued my journey. And being part of This Is My Brave and, and getting to meet some amazing people that I've met in this process has been truly transformative and awesome to sit with individuals like yourselves and recognize that not only are you not alone, but we are making huge strides in both awareness and advocacy all together. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, I think back to my first therapist in 2005. I was 23 years old. I was like a, less than a year out of the Navy. I was still a huge alcoholic. And I saw a therapist at the VA. So I'm a disabled, rated disabled veteran. So I saw a therapist at the VA clinic in California and they tossed me to an intern. And after the first couple of sessions, he told me straight up, he was like, uh, you've taken yourself about as far as I would get you. So I don't know how else to bring you any farther. I'm really sorry. I can't help any more than what you're at now. Mm -hmm. And just proceeded to tell me that he couldn't help me anymore. And so I didn't go to therapy for years after that. And that was, you know, four years after 9-11 and just after coming out of being in the Navy and being in this, you know, we talk about toxic masculinity and toxic positivity and all of these things. And me also being Filipino American, I'm first generation American. I grew up in an emotionally silent home. We did not talk about any of that unless it was about me getting an A or a B on my report card 
or when we're going to church or the grocery store, it didn't get talked about. So when one of my friends died and when I was in high school and I came home crying, my mom's like, why are you crying? That's not even your cousin. It's just a classmate. I'm like, but I'm still sad for some reason. And I'm still going to go to the funeral and I'm going to miss class. And she was like, oh, you're not going to miss class as a good Asian mom that she is. And it was just so weird to me. So I took all of these things as I grew older and as I moved out and as I learned, and it wasn't until late into my twenties and now, and then early thirties and now I'm into my late thirties that I'm just like coming to grips with emotional intelligence. And now that I have two kids of my own that I'm trying to teach to be social, emotionally aware children, instead of being emotionally silent, that's like, thank God that my wife and I communicate as well as we do. And we're open as our feelings as we are, because the only way we're going to change the narrative or break the cycle is if we teach our kids, in addition to working through ourselves and doing the work on ourselves, how we speak through our feelings, especially as men. Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head um, to, to kind of let everybody backstage. We had a list of questions and stuff that we were going to go over and talking points to keep things moving. Um, Kevin, I'll ask you, what are your thoughts on the idea of toxic masculinity? Like, is it real? Is it not real? Kind of what does that mean to you? Well, I've been thinking about this uh, all day today. I did some research on it. Um, and it turns out the phrase was introduced in the 80s and 90s. So it's about as old as I am. I was born in 79. And I, I was really thinking about my teenage years when I wanted to be a comic book illustrator. And I had this huge poster of the Punisher in my bedroom. And I was drawing pictures of the Punisher. For those who don't know, he's a vigilante. He, was armed. he doesn't have any superpowers. He carries guns. And he goes around and he's a vigilante and he kills criminals. And uh, recently, within the past maybe 10 years, Law enforcement has kind of adopted his logo, which is a big skull, as their logo for law enforcement. That's a different conversation. But as a teenager, that was sort of my favorite superhero. And I remember being in art class one day, and art was the only class that I really enjoyed in high school. And I drew a picture of the Punisher with a big gun. And a teacher who came by, and she said, why are you always drawing people with guns? And I just sort of laughed at her. I didn't pay much mind to it. But I started thinking about what sort of environment was I in uh, as a teenager where, and I mean, you can look at all sorts of influences in the 80s and 90s when I grew up. I had a Rambo lunchbox. My favorite movies were like Arnold Schwarzenegger, The Terminator. You know, this, this macho uh, persona, uh, man with big muscles, real beefy dude with a machine gun was something that had an allure to me and something that I wanted to emulate and draw pictures of. So I was thinking about that today and I was reading about the origins of the phrase toxic masculinity. And I have some friends who actually work in the comic book industry and I've had conversations with them where they've talked about how 90% of comics are white male power fantasies. And that kind of hit home to me because this is kid I wasn't really thinking critically about these things that I was ingesting and consuming but as an adult and I look back at it I can look back and see if you're somebody who doesn't fit in or you're artistic or you're feeling you're being bullied maybe these images of a strong male kind of resonate with you and uh, you're attracted to them so that that's where my mind went when I thought about toxic masculinity I do think that um, we live in a world where it exists and I do think that it is rewarded and that's why it perpetuates. And I think about things I've done in my own life that I'm not so proud of and things I did to try to fit in with other men or try to be one of the boys and even things that I've gotten away with uh, that maybe I shouldn't have gotten away with. And um, just analyzing my life and looking back and thinking about all these things that are out there and how if there had been, um, I don't know, I, I think growing up in the 80s and 90s that there had been more visibility for being tender or being sweet, but it wasn't, I don't know if I would have been attracted to it because I wanted something that was kind of cool and rebellious. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, man, for sure. I think, you know, one of the things that popped into my head as you were talking was 
so I'm only a couple years younger than you guys. I'm in my mid thirties. So I, I can relate to a vast majority of things you're saying. And uh, as someone who is in civil service since he was a teenager, the idea of the hero and the rescuer and the protector and all of that was a life that I quite literally lived and still live in a number of different healthcare settings. Um, I remember whenever I was told to man up, that never meant talk about your feelings. <laughs> that never meant like, tell me what you need right now, right? When someone told you to man up, it was whatever you're doing needs to stop, stiff upper lip, stand up straight, be tougher, be stronger. Right. And, and especially when you're young, that reinforces, you know, people can only say man up so many times before you believe that being a man is either being anything on the spectrum, right? Being quiet and not talking about it or being loud and forcing your way or, you know, being immediately embarrassed or ashamed as soon as you start to show emotion. And I think it's fascinating. I, I try really hard to curate my, my Instagram feed around like mental health and positivity and, and all of these things. And I try really hard to follow a bunch of male uh, mental health professionals um, of all races, creeds, ethnic ethnicities, and looking to see them change the face of what man up means, right? Like you said, man up when we were kids was Rambo, was Chuck Norris. I remember getting a pair of like jeans that you could do an ax kick in like Chuck Norris, right? Like, <laughs> and, and changing that to still being strong, still being confident, still being self-assured, but all of the other components that, as, as Marlon said, and as Kevin alluded to, all the things that you now know you need to be a strong father figure, to be a strong male role model, to be all of these things, and not just the dude that, you know, blows up buildings and kicks people and stuff like that. Yeah, right, right on top of that, I think one of the biggest things that was a factor in growing up with toxic masculinity, it's one of those things that I'm glad that I grew out of and learned about, was actually, um, homophobia like mm -hmm. everything growing up if you if you cried if you had feelings you're like oh that's gay that's gay everything that was weird or different the insult was that's gay and at the time you just you knew it to be bad like I was 10 like I was 12 you know I was a fifth grader I was a sixth grader you know what am I supposed to do like I'm not gay I like girls why are you telling me that this is bad then as I got older and realized homophobia is a real thing you know like People aren't supposed to say the R word. People aren't supposed to say the N word. People aren't supposed to say all these sorts, sorts of things. And it's okay to have these feelings. It's okay to not only have those feelings, but to acknowledge them. And it's actually healthier to do that. And it's one of my favorite examples, I'm also still embarrassed of, but it's still one of my favorite examples, is when people talk about like, what Avenger do you associate with the most? Because everybody, like most people I know love the MCU and they talk about like, Team Iron Man or Team Captain America or whomever, whatever, blah, blah, blah. My two favorites are Hawkeye and Hulk. And people are like, <laughs> why? And I'm like, I'm all of five, four and a half, 190 pounds. I'm not a big guy. I was 120 when I graduated from high school, soaking wet. So like, and then I went into the military and they're like, you're going to get crushed. But at the same time, I have this anger inside me. So I would be this like happy go lucky, let's like, let's play a game, let's make a deal, let's go for a walk, let's do something fun. But as soon as something flipped, and whether it was racism or homophobia or somebody like hit a woman or something like anything that would trigger me off, I would like Dragon Ball Z into this other form and just hulk out. And whether we would be getting into bar fights and this is all well, while being an alcoholic, while being addicted to opioids and all these substances and everything, like this was such a manic, horrible time. And at the same time, we're being told to man up. At the same time, we're being told, don't be gay. And so there's just like this, this environment that we're thrust into, whether we're coming from first generation American families or third generation American families, whether we're you know, like foreign exchange students or whether you're someone that's moved to a different state and you're completely different culture on your own, like all of it's a part of who we are, but it's like, you have to have your own aha moment or reality check before you really start to do the work on yourself and yeah. sometimes it's a coach or a teacher or a partner or somebody that's about to become your ex that tells you about your life and tells you you need to get help and after like the fifth or sixth person telling yourself that maybe you actually do need to get help and that's okay like asking for help learning to ask for help and learning how to say no are probably two of the most important things i've learned to do in the last five years of my life 
Yeah. I'll say that again for people in the back. Learning how to say no and learning how to ask for help are two of the, the most important things I've ever learned, but especially in the last five years. I yeah. would say the uh, flip side of the homophobia would be the way that men treat women. Mm. And I would say that uh, objectifying women or being abusive towards women or um, feeling like if you're in the friend zone, it's a failure and you can't just be friends with women and you have mm -hmm. to be sexually active to be uh, a, a man. You know, that's, those are damaging things that go on in our society. And I know that me wrestling with my own masculinity, I've had instances in my life where I've had relationships and friendships that I've been toxic in because I wasn't able to figure these things out. And luckily, I've been able to get help and um, I'm a better person now, but uh, when I was a young man, I didn't understand all these emotions and feelings that I had. Yeah, and, and how, how complicated all of that can be. And to both your points, right, when, when we sit with our guy friends, right, and nobody can see the air quotes, right, our guy friends, and I don't necessarily mean friends, I mean men that we hang out with, right, that may or may not be a positive influence, Right. right. Nobody's like, what do you do to make your significant other feel special? Right. We're all like, oh, yeah. talk about the sex, talk about this, talk about that. And that can, if you're not very careful, right, that can really progress into just like Kevin said, right. Thinking about like, oh, this is a conquest or these are the things that have to happen. Um, and uh, to Marlon's point, you know, uh, I completely appreciate I was incredibly fortunate. I I was really, really into theater and drama when I was young, so I was immersed into a very um, anti-homophobia culture, but I would still say don't be gay, right? Because I, I couldn't, it didn't process that like, oh, what you are saying is that's silly or that's ridiculous or whatever, mm -hmm. but you don't even appreciate that what you're doing is sincerely insulting someone's sexual orientation. Um, and I'm super fortunate that I had friends, both gay, straight, and bi, that were like, hey, asshole, when you say that, that hurts, right? Like, right. The, you don't even appreciate what you're saying, but that's really, really uncomfortable. Well, it's a lot of learning and programming that we kind of have to actively work to deprogram ourselves from and to unlearn. And it's not gay people's job to do it. It's not women's job to do it. Not our significant other's job to do it. It's something as a man that we need to take accountability for and mm -hmm. take inventory of ourselves and what we've done and what we put people through and kind of work on our own issues so that we're not doing it in the future. Yeah, exactly. And I think when you look at what masculinity can be in place of toxic masculinity, right? If, if you look at how you can grow and build I don't think there's anything more masculine and I, we're like trapping this in gender roles. I don't mean it to, right? but I don't think there's anything more adult and anything more healthy than the willingness to grow and evolve. Right. I don't wear my clothes the same way I used to wear them. I don't wear my hair the same way I used to wear it. Right. Like you just grow and evolve with that. And that's easy because it's superficial and like somebody else can help you with it, but you can make all of the emotional and spiritual change as well. And nothing mm -hmm. is keeping you from making that change except you and your willingness to experience it. I'm not saying it's easy. I don't think anybody in this room would tell you that it was easy, um, but it's absolutely something that you can do, which I think ties us into a, a topic that we touched on with Marlon when we talked about the semicolon, um, male suicide. Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll lead with the talking point of my first responder based um, mental health initiative is uh, one first responder commits suicide every four days in the United States of America, um, which doesn't hold the candle to our military veterans rate of suicide. Um, but on the male side of the coin, our male registered nurses uh, commit suicide three times more often than their female counterparts. So as we look all throughout a vast majority of civil service, both military and civilian, we see astronomic suicide rates. And I think in a lot of the work that I've done, we've touched on some of those points, right? When I spent a lot of time, full-time paramedic in a busy urban system with a lot of brilliant people, there was not a lot of talk about our feelings, right? Hey, you watched a 28-year-old die in a car accident. Are you okay? It was, hey, you got another call. Or, hey, let's get a bite to eat and then get out of there, right? It was like, how deep can we push this down before we go do something? And I I don't think that's unique to men in civil service in the military. I think that that is 
a male prerogative that it's just easier to run away from it than it is to sit with it. And I think um, our female counterparts are much more comfortable sitting with uncomfortability for the most part. Again, I know we're putting like sweeping gender roles on everything, but I think more women are comfortable sitting in discomfort than men are, right? It's much easier for me to go for a run than to cry. <laughs> like it hurts, it hurts more and less at the same time, right? Like it's easier for me to like burn all that off and do something where, where we see other people that are a bit more emotionally mature be able to really sit in that uncomfortability. Um, we got some stats that we pulled up here. Um, we, we essentially mimicked the, the male to female nurse, uh, men die by suicide at a rate 3.54% higher than women. Um, some stats from Mental Health America report that 6 million men are affected by depression, as we've all talked about. Uh, that's one in 10. Our rates of alcohol abuse and alcoholism are fast math triple what it is to women. Um, and we are three times more likely to use drugs, and we are still the leading cause of death among men is suicide. So of all the ways that we can die, the most likely is suicide. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's uh, shocking, but at the same time, not surprising. Right. Yeah. Well, put. You know, I think that's the best way that I can respond to that is that it's even looking at different professions. And like I was a classroom teacher for a couple of years and seeing how people cope, whether they are men or women, whether they're in their 20s or in their 40s and alcohol is a quick turn to or when I was in the military and I was on submarine, there was a lot of tobacco users, whether it was dip or cigarettes or whatever it was that there is definitely drinking in every port. And there was all of these things that a wonderful example I have of asking for help that I will never ever forget was when I was in the Navy and I asked to go to rehab. I asked my doc on my boat and I was like, I have an alcohol problem. I want to get help. And I was denied help. And he said to me, well, just the fact that you're asking for help already puts you ahead of the curve. You're good. Wow. Yeah. Great. Like great. That went on for years. That was 2002 when I was on my boat, I probably just got a hold of my alcohol problem in the last four or five years, if that. And it's still something I deal with, you know, like on a monthly, if not weekly basis, because you have to make the choice of like, no, I'm not bringing that into my home or yes, it's in my home or I'm not going to abuse it or I'm just going to have, you know, one drink and drink responsibly because we're sitting outside on the back patio when the kids are asleep. Like these are decisions that get made and every time I see somebody's post on Instagram or Twitter about however long they've been sober, I will like and retweet the hell out of that post. I'm <laughs> like, I'm proud of you. It's a struggle, whether it's been a week or whether it's been seven years and do what you need to do. And it's uh, asking for help is something that that is so hard to do because not only are you putting yourself out there saying, I have a vulnerability, I am weak and I need help you're also trying to figure out the right person to ask. You have to figure out, will this person help me or will this person brush me off? Like, are they in, do they have the mental space to even receive what I'm trying to give them right now? Mm -hmm. So asking for help is like, you can't even, you can't ask for help by yourself, obviously, because you need to ask somebody else, but you can only go halfway. Absolutely. And what I tell, when I say my brothers and my brothers and sisters, right, I mean people in this space, right? When I tell my brothers that reach out and when I share my own experience, you know, I'm very vocal about what I do and I run this platform and I help run my uh, healthcare agency's peer support team. So I'm, I'm in it, right? And, and people will make fun of me all the time. And the same person that's been making fun of me for being, you know, Captain Hugs a lot or whatever is the same guy that'll follow me out and be like, so how did you get a hold of that person? Like what number can I call and who can I reach out to, right? Um, and the only pushback I'm going to give you is I tell everybody that you're not weak when you ask for help. That's actually the strongest thing to do. I don't know that sounds like something dumb, like you see on a t-shirt, but really it takes, like we just said, it's so much easier to run away from it than it is to reach out and get help. And I was thinking of as far as the suicide and as far as being weak and being vulnerable, I think a lot of it has to do with control. Mm -hmm. And when you admit that you need help and that you're weak or you're vulnerable, you're losing control. Whereas when you 
to try to attempt the act of suicide is like that's something you can control your destiny or your fate even if it's grim and deadly for yourself you're seizing control of it so that's mm -hmm. just a thought i was having about uh while I was listening to uh, marlon speak I think that's spot on for sure. And it, it kind of ties back into that toxic masculinity, right? Like when we talk about what a man should be, and we hope that everybody listening to this and interacting with us knows that we don't think this is what a man should be anymore. But what, what many of us were taught, that's what a man should be. That idiom of control is really important, right? And I think that's a great point of like, well, why ask for help when you can do it this way? Um, I think now's a great time to point out that everyone listening to this, whether you're happy, sad, angry, mad, or in between, needs to remember that suicide is an incredibly permanent solution to a very temporary problem. And as much as it sucks, and you're talking to three guys that have been there and have experienced the suck and know what their own personal bottom feels like, it is absolutely temporary. And there are a number of resources out there that I know that Katie and Jen are going to put out there for you, but know that you always have people to talk to if you feel as though you're unsafe or that you might be a harm to yourself or someone else. So please don't forget that. Definitely. I actually, uh, in my blog, link below, normalmarlin.wordpress.com, in my blog I wrote about my most recent suicide attempt and my hospital stay afterwards. I was hospitalized in a psychiatric ward for a week after that attempt. And one of my pastors came to visit me um, several times during the week, which I was really grateful for. And one of the things that she told me, I'll never forget, she had said to me, and I don't know if either of you are church going or God believing folks, but one of the things that she told me is that when you attempt suicide, that's like you telling God that his plan isn't good enough for you. And it was like, what? Yeah, that it is. Like, it's going back to it being a control issue. Like, if my life is so terrible, I'm going to control it and end it because nothing that I'm doing is making it any better. So I'm going to make it worse. Doesn't matter if it's for anybody else. I'm going to try and end it and cut it off so the pain stops. But at the same time, we were all created in God's image. We're all figures of, like, our, we were born of our mothers. Like, we are creations of our parents. Like, we're all of us are walking miracles at the same time and an attempt at suicide. And I think that's, it's perfect that it's called an attempt, whether it's quote unquote successful or failed, that you're attempting to tell God that he's not in control or that he can't do what he wants with you. Or and you I know like, there's a whole other conversation on spirituality and control and those type of things too. But for the, for the God believing, like God varying person that I am, that really affected me when she told me that my attempt was me telling God that his plan wasn't good enough for me. And since then, things have been actually getting better. Like my faith has been, my faith has been restructured in the last four or five years. And I grew up in the church. I was an altar boy. I grew up Catholic. You know, I went to the church for years, stopped going for years, went to the bars instead, and then chose to get baptized right before my daughter was born. My wife and I both got baptized again. And uh, things that have just changed in my life, like my, my faith has helped my mental health. My mental health has helped my faith. It has been completely intertwined on both sides of it. So I've been very grateful to have friends at church, uh, male friends at church that I can talk about feelings with. We can talk about um, arguments with our wives. We can talk about our sex lives and have healthy conversations. We can talk about the stresses of parenting and I'm becoming closer friends with some of these guys that I've had three, four, five conversations with at church than I was with like guys that I spent two years on a boat with when we didn't see any other humans with the same 150 guys we saw every day. I was on submarine. So it's like, how, how are we feeding ourselves and how, like, which wolf are we feeding? Are we feeding the good wolf or the bad wolf? And like, which one are we going to nurture with the friendships that we have? And if we're going to be the average of our five closest friends, it really makes you look at who your closest friends are and figure out like, do I want to be the average of these five people or do I want to be above average or how can I change that? So there's ask, sometimes asking for help is also more proactive on your part where you can just look for different friends. That's a huge, a huge part of your life. And it's you, whether it's work friends or neighborhood friends, like you spend sometimes more time at work than you do at home. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a toxic environment at work, 
And if that's something you have to change, you can change that job. There's, there's other jobs out there. And I know job hunting isn't the greatest and income's a wonderful thing, but if it'll make your sanity a little better and if it'll improve your home life, and if it'll keep you out of the hospital, by all means, make a change. Yeah, the, the biggest thing I heard you say in all that is, is choice, right? Is that you're, you're always armed with choice. Um, mm -hmm. Kevin, I know you were you were going to say something. I don't want to. I want to make sure you get a chance well, to say it. We were talking about suicide and religion, and I just know that I've heard people say things like, "Oh, if you commit suicide, you go to hell," and I don't think that's helpful to hear. I think that's stigmatizing, and um, I mean, I, I I think that the act of suicide is something that uh, I, I just don't think it's helpful to hear things like that. When right. you're sick or you're dealing with mental health and hearing that, oh, that person, especially if you have a loved one or a family member or somebody who's died by suicide, to hear, oh, they're in hell now or something. I, I, I just wanted to chime in that little piece of it. Of, uh, Absolutely. Again. And I am, I, I'm certainly not the most spiritual in the room. Um, I, I was raised Catholic and, and have some awareness of Catholicism. One of the last suicide courses that I took on the crisis counselor side of the coin, um, they talked about how the, the Catholic church is changing where if a member of your family commits suicide, you, the family members are still allowed in church. Um, in, in more traditional practice, if a family member committed suicide, the family was removed from the church. Um, and, and I think that that's great in the sense that you don't, take another support system away from people that are grieving a loss yeah. um, and, and again not not to be reiterated but if any of you are, are struggling with listening to this because we've been very suicide heavy um, please reach out you know that you're not alone and there are a number of resources that are able to help you um, i think we're going to hit uh, our, our wrap-up point here reasonably soon the last point i want to talk on quickly um what have you guys been doing during quarantine how, is, how has COVID affected your mental health and how has quarantine, whether or not you've had it, um, made you better or worse? Well, it's actually been, um, it's been very, I've been feeling guilty because I've been doing really well. I've lost about 40 pounds. Um, I've been really productive. I, I got three hours of my day back because I'm not commuting every day. Um, so I've been very productive with my music and my art. I started going to therapy. And uh, when I made the appointment in March, I had a lot of things I wanted to talk about. I was afraid I was going to relapse. And then when I finally spoke to the um, to my psychiatrist last two weeks ago, I told her that I didn't know what to talk about because I've been doing so well and I've been feeling guilty about doing well. My friends were like, "Don't feel guilty. Like, shine. Yeah. Do you? You'll inspire other people. They'll see you're doing good." And uh, I've really just been really productive and I, I'm lucky that I still have a job. I can work telework and I've been very productive with my music and my art. So I, I, I've actually, I feel bad because there's horrible things going on and people are dying and cities are burning and there's injustice uh, going on in the country, but I, I've been doing well. And I think it's important to point out a couple of things because you made, you made an excellent point. You can still succeed and help other people, right? I think especially as we've all gone through our own struggles, um, I want to make sure that people know that they can support a number of the causes that exist right now. And we're not touching on who to support and who not to support, right? But you can, you can support what you believe in. You can help those that you can help and you can recharge your batteries and do well at the same time. That can all exist in a bit. Um, Marlon, what are your, uh, what's your take on how quarantine's affected you? On, on one hand, quarantine has been awesome. I, like, I was fortunate enough to keep my job. I was able to work from home. So I spent, I got more time with the family. Like instead of leaving before the kids got up and then getting home like an hour before bedtime, I was having three meals a day with all four of us around the table. You know, it was taking breaks to go outside during lunch, playing the grass. You know, it's uh, there was a lot of great things. My wife and I, we got to spend more time together. It's really done wonders for our marriage, like just having this more time that we've been able to spend together. Um, so that's been awesome. But the other side of it is the extrovert side has been really struggling for both my wife yeah. and I. We're, let me we're out, both, let me out. Yeah. I, like, like, I told her like the, after like the third week of quarantine, I was like, look, I was on a submarine for, for a couple of years and this is harder. <laughs> I feel more <laughs> like, alone now, yeah. 
being on a submarine was like because logically on a submarine you can't go anywhere you're underwater and you're stuck there it's not like you can just leave the boat and go home here at home like you can still see outside you can still see the sun get up every day you can yeah. still see the sun go down you can see the trash truck like pick up your trash every week like you see people taking walks down your street so it's so weird to put yourself in this place of really like checking your own integrity of like am i gonna go anywhere am i gonna wear a mask how safe do I want to keep my babies? And I think that was really the uh, deciding factor for my wife and I is that like we have two toddlers and we want to change the world by raising good people. So if we're going to raise the, like change the world and raise good people, we have to keep ourselves alive and we have to keep them alive. And if we have to keep them alive by not seeing other people, then we're going to suck it up and not see other people. And like her, we have my wife's birthday. Um, was last month and I organized this big Zoom call for her and there were probably like 15, 17 people on the Zoom call and it was cool to see a bunch of people and that's the best we could do at that point. But at the same time, we're like, man, like this is what, if this is the biggest of our problems right now, then we're doing really well. You know, yeah. things like Black Lives Matter are happening. Things like revolutions are happening in other countries and all of these, um, all of these problems are happening and the racial injustices and all of these, you know, we hear about them every day. And if the biggest problem that my family's going through is trying to figure out who's going to have to go to the grocery store next week and who's going to have to wear the mask, because then maybe one of us is going to have a panic attack or one of us is going to have like freak out and, you know, in the middle of the store and, you know, whether it's depression or anxiety or bipolar and dealing through those little swings and, and episodes while mm -hmm. all of this crazy pandemic is happening that we just have to remind ourselves we're in the middle of a pandemic right like pan meaning like the entire world like this is happening this is real life and unfortunately we have like family friends who still think it's a hoax and at the same time like there's people that are like oh yeah we're gonna come over and we're gonna go fleet garage garage sailing and flea marketing whatever and then i want to come over and see the kids nope you're not gonna see the kids yeah because i don't know where you've been Mm -hmm. so we just got to keep our family safe. So like there's been a lot of highs and a lot of lows, you know, we're trying to make it every day that we can, you know, we've gotten used to zoom calls here and there. And it's like, if that's the way we get to see people, that's the way we get to see people. So we, we spend a lot of time. We've been on a big Harry Potter kick lately. There you go. Um, all the time to catch up. Yeah. He has challenged me to watch all the Marvel movies. I have oh. gladly accepted that challenge. <laughs> um, so there's there's been a lot of good things happening with the family and uh luckily it's been nice for outside so playing out in the backyard with the kids and letting them run around and burn off some steam so the adults can have adult time at the end of the day it's uh on the relationship side of things i will say that one of the things that helped the most is being more intimate with my wife and i don't mean that in a purely sexual way i just mean being intimate in the fact that we get to spend time together, whether it means we get up early before the kids get up and have coffee together, or we watch a show on Amazon Prime, or we go over bills together, or we do the dishes together, or we fold laundry after the kids go to bed. Like, just spending more time together has really gotten us through this, this pandemic, and it's done wonders for our marriage at the same time. So staying healthy and strengthening your relationship, double win. That's awesome. Um, it looks like we're getting our, our five minute warning here. So uh, my guys, the last question I'll ask everybody is one piece of advice you'd give any man you bumped into, what would it be, Kevin? I would say if your circle of friends and your network isn't supportive or isn't where you want to be, uh, try to widen your circle and reach out to people who you admire, who you want to be in their circle. I know I do that in my personal life. I reach out to people who are living the life I want to live. I ask them questions. I inquire, how did they get there? How did they do it? And maybe they'll reject you, but maybe they'll take you along for the ride. with them. So. I love it. Marlon, how about you? Uh, I'm going to thank, this is my brave for this piece of information. Once again, storytelling saves lives. And it really does. Use your voice. I use that hashtag all the time in my blogs. Hashtag use your voice. Again, check out the blog link down below. Use your voice, but more importantly, listen. It's okay to change your point of view if you learn new material. Use your voice. If you don't know if your stance is right or not, if you if you're questioning your beliefs, if you're whether it's about 
your faith or your relationship or your job, or if it's whether you put peanut butter on the sandwich first or jelly on the sandwich first, ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. I personally don't put peanut butter on my sandwiches because I would die, honestly, like I'm allergic. So I don't put peanut butter on my sandwiches. (laughs) Just in case you were wondering, but yes, use your voice and listen. We were given voices, we were given ears, we were given two ears, one mouth, so listen twice as much as you talk. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, if I, my one-liner, um, I love what Marlon said and I want to echo it. Um, if you haven't learned something new throughout this environment that we're in, um, you have some homework to do. Uh, I think no matter where you stand, I think there's plenty of learning to be done about what's actually going on in the world. Um, it is perfectly okay to protect your own mental health while you're trying to decipher all of this and find your stance and support your stance. And what I will say until my last breath, especially for the men in the room and especially for the male health care providers in the room, it is okay to not be okay. You are not weak. You are not a failure. It's okay. Get help. Hey guys, sorry, thanks for bearing with me while I reshared my camera, but I have been listening intently. I thank you all for being such inspiring role models for men speaking out about the importance of, of knowing it's okay to not be okay, knowing that your mental health is, should be a priority and talking about it and building that strong support system around you are, those are crucial things that can help you on the journey, as we so call it. Tonight's com- or today's conversation, it reminded me of um, what's, what I found on social media recently with what's going on in our world with this social justice movement, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, is Emmanuel Acho's mm. conversations oh. with a black man. I felt like you yes. guys tonight did uncomfortable conversations about men and mental health, and I'm so appreciative to all of you. For being a part of this thank you so, for giving us a platform yeah absolutely thank you so much we're always honored to be here you guys thank are you awesome. for having me you guys are awesome i hope that everyone has enjoyed the conversation thanks for chatting with us we love engaging with you um i hope you guys will join us next saturday at 2 p.m again for our um another episode of brave tv featuring our comedic brave storytellers as we talk about finding humor in the journey so can't wait to see you then Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks so much, guys. Bye, guys. Take care. Be well.